Epaphroditus tonight. Um, but I like um, verse 20 and 21. For I have no man like-minded, speaking about Timothy, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Now we said this morning um, that Timothy probably met Paul on his first missionary journey. And you'll find that, that he went to Derby and Lystra in Acts chapter 14. Six years later, five, four to six years later, probably right around six years later, in Acts 16, you'll find that Paul came back to Derby and Lystra and, and Timothy, by that time, had a good report among the brethren. And we'll, we'll, we'll go over there here just in a moment. But um, that's probably when he accepted Christ is that first missionary journey. And we know that he had some godly training according to the book of First Timothy, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, excuse me, his mother and his grandmother is what the Bible says. But nevertheless, Tim Timothy had the right mind. He had a servant's mind. He naturally cared for people and was concerned about their needs. In other words, he wasn't a put-on. He, he wasn't a put-on. Um, he, he, he had a good heart. I mean, he had a, he had a pure heart. And the only way you can have a pure heart, of course, according to the book of Acts chapter 15, is to trust Christ. But um, in the Bible, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says this concerning Timothy as well. Not only did he say it to the Philippian, to the church at, at, at Philippi, to the Philippians, but he also said it to the Corinthians. In 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 17, he's, Paul said this to the Corinthians, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Everywhere in every church. Well, just that statement right there in verse number 17 shows you that Paul was not talking about an invisible church. I mean, he was talking about the local manifestation of the body, which is the local assembly. Amen. So Timothy was concerned, Paul was concerned with the churches, and Timothy, of course, was concerned for people. He was concerned, genuinely concerned with people's needs. Now, Timothy was concerned about doing right, even if it caused him not to win popularity. And any true preacher pastor will have that kind of attitude. They won't be mean. We talked about that this morning. This is where I got off the message this morning. Um, in in um, actually, um, uh, Timothy, where it says... Um, um, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So how, do, how are we to instruct those that oppose themselves? In, in meekness is what the Bible says. And so we took a, we took a turn there this morning and went off um, in that direction, and the Lord sure blessed it. So um, anyway, Paul wanted someone who would give the facts. John, the, the Apostle John said in 2 John and also 3 John, and in 1 John he said... Uh, give the truth to the elect lady in 2 John, whom I love in the truth. And then he talked about Gaius in 3 John being in a church that was uh, in disarray. And he said, uh, whom I love in the truth. So we're to give the truth in love. There's a way to give truth. We don't beat people over the head with the truth. We, we instruct those that oppose themselves and we do it in meekness. Now meekness is not weakness. We, we need to be strong in our presentation of the truth, but be meek in doing so. Amen? Is what the Bible tells us to do. All right, now, there were, uh, there were hundreds of Christians in Rome. Uh, and fact is, I'm not going to turn there, but over in the book of Romans chapter 16, Paul named at least, what, 25, 26, 27 Christians there just in that particular chapter uh, in, in Romans chapter number 16. But if you'll notice in verse 21, 
of Philippians chapter 2 again. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Back up to verse 19 or, or verse 20. But I have no man like-minded who will natu naturally care for your state. Verse 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. So Paul had singled it down to a man named Timothy whom he could trust and knew that Paul would care for their soul. Isn't, uh, now tonight we're in one of two places, really. We're either, uh, you've, heard, you've heard sermons on this, I'm sure, we're either a Philippians 121 Christian or a 221 Christian. If, if you'll notice in Philippians 121, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then in 221, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. So either you're, you realize what you're here for to serve others and to bring honor and glory and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ according to Ephesians 1 and many other places in the Scripture. Do all of the glory of God. The, the Corinthian writer, uh, Paul speaks of it in Corinthians as well. Or we're uh, for our own gain. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy for a local church, especially the leaders, to be more concerned about self than concerned about others. Now, in other words, people that have no time for the Lord, if you'll notice in... Um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. The Bible said, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Uh, there are some people that just uh, are in it for the gain. They're really not concerned about people. And that's a terrible thing. Uh, for leaders to be in a local church of that caliber. Now, not only did Timothy have a, a right mind and a servant's mind, but he had the right training. Uh, Timothy knew what to do. And the only reason he knew what to do is because he had the right training. In verse 22 of Philippians chapter 2, the Bible said, But you know the proof of him... That as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. As a son with the father. Now, Paul did not add Timothy to his team the very day he was saved. Paul left him behind to become part of the church fellowship in Derby and Lystra. And this is where he grew spiritually. You grow spiritually in the local assembly. Anyone that does not want to be identified with the local assembly will always suffer spiritually. It will always be a spiritual pauper. Now the Bible says again in Acts chapter 14, verse number 1 and 2, and it came to pass and I... Well, no, 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 verse 6, excuse me. Verse 6. They were aware of it and fled into Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and into the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. Now, that's important in this message tonight because that's where Timothy lived. There they preached the gospel. I believe that Timothy got a hold of the gospel. And if you'll notice in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 1, the Bible said, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, and believed, but his father was a Greek. And if you'll notice verse 2, what, what it says of Timothy, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So Timothy had four, five, maybe six years, had actually proved himself. He had a good report of the brethren. And when a person gets saved, I've found it can be very damaging to shove them right in the ministry. To shove them right in the ministry. Here, take it and go. It's the same way with a job. It's the same way with a secular job. You just don't hire somebody off the street and then tell them they're the manager the next day. Well, I'm sure it's been done, but they've lived to regret it as well. Well, you don't come in the church and just get saved and expect for you to, expect you to, uh, to be granted uh, to be a Sunday school teacher or a, or, or a youth leader or, or a nursery worker or a uh, more team leader. No, you have to stay and you prove yourself. Well, Timothy grew spiritually. 
Now again, we know according to 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 5, he had good instruction. Paul came back to Timothy, and Timothy was well reported of, of the brethren. Years later, Paul wrote to Timothy about the importance of permitting new converts to grow before trusting them in the ministry. Now, if you'll take your Bibles, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul wrote Timothy, here's our instruction, about the importance of permitting new converts to grow before thrusting them into the ministry. The Bible says in chapter 3, verse 6 and 7 of 1 Timothy, speaking of the bishop, it says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, verse 7, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. He needs to grow. Moses stayed 40 years in the backside of the desert, keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, before God actually commissioned him there in Exodus chapter number 3 through the burning bush. 40 years. 40 years old when he left, 40 years in the desert, Moses was 80 years old. Now, I don't know if it would be a wise thing in this day and age to hang around to your 80 to start working for the Lord, but you see my point now. You see my point uh, with being trained. What about Joshua? Joshua stayed with Moses and learned and, and uh, studied and was very subservient and learned what God wanted him to learn, and then Joshua took his place as leader of Israel. What about David? David, the little ruddy uh, shepherd. And of course, he grew and he learned. And David learned a lot of lessons in the caves, didn't he? David learned a lot of lessons uh, uh, in the wilderness and through trials of life and storms. And that's where he grew. What about Elisha? You remember Elisha stayed with Elijah. Elijah gave him every opportunity to get some R&R &R and to leave. Uh, but Elisha said, as, my so as I soul liveth and the Lord liveth, I will not leave you. And he went. And because he kept with the stuff, he stayed with the stuff, he learned what he could learn. He was taught. He had a, he had a very a servant's mind, a servant's attitude, and a servant's heart that when Elijah was taken up, then Elisha got what he asked for, that double portion of the Spirit. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. And you go on and look at Paul and Timothy. Did you know that Paul, according to the uh, first chapter of Galatians, if you'd like to turn back there, the first chapter of Galatians, um, the Bible says concerning Saul of Tarsus and Paul, uh, it says, um, verse 17, Neither, Paul said of chapter 1 of Galatians, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then, after three years, he went a little time in Arabia, I don't know how long, but uh, combined with the time in Damascus, the Bible said, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. So even Saul of Tarsus, as learned as he was in Old Testament scripture, uh, God straightened out his theology before God began to use him as an apostle to the Gentiles. That's just the way God works, amen? Amen. There was a fellow told me one time, he said he wanted to be used, and, uh, but he was never faithful, never faithful. Uh, we have some people that'll, that'll even come to church today and say, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to do. Will you make me in charge of this? Will you put me in charge of that? Will you use me in this? I said, I would love to use you. It's happened to the last 35 years of my ministry, people coming in saying, will you use me? I said, I'd love to use you, but first of all, prove yourself. Stay faithful to the local church. Stay faithful to the Lord. Let people see Christ in you. Six years later, Timothy had a good report of the brethren when Paul came back through Iconium and Lystra and Derby. You see, I can't say enough good things about the local church. Turn over to Ephesians chapter number two, if you will. The church is the training ground. And by the way, um, this is where you ought to be trained. This is where you ought to grow. It's a sad thing that people go in churches and they're the same in the same spiritual condition 
uh, 30 years later, sitting in the same pew, warming the same bench, and, um, and, and you, you know exactly what mentality I'm speaking of. Talking to an individual uh, for years and years and years about uh, salvation and about uh, where people go when they die and what happens to the body. And then at the funeral home, after several years, they asked me, what happened to my mother? What happened? And they were serious. They, I mean, it was a big blank. Some, some people will sit in the... And it's a sad thing to go to a local assembly and not have a teacher and a pastor and Sunday school teachers and youth leaders that love you enough to want you to get, get you from point A to point B. I can't say enough about the local church. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles... And the prophets, the, uh, the prophets and the apostles laid the foundation and there's no other uh, foundation that can be laid than that's laid already is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And then it goes on to say here in Ephesians chapter 2 that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We don't lay foundations in local churches. We don't come up up here with new doctrine. We don't preach something brand new and say, let me just lay the foundation. We don't do that. The foundation's already been laid. You know what we do as a local assembly? We build on the foundation. And that foundation is solid. That foundation will never crack. That foundation is sure. The foundation being the Word of God and salvation by grace through faith. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, Himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. My dear friend, that's the local church. Amen. Anyone that breaks fellowship with the local church is nothing in the world but a spiritual pauper. Stay with the local assembly. You say, well, I don't like everything going on in the local church. Well, there's no perfect local assembly. There's not. You can go back to the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter, I mean the uh, parable of the mustard seed in Matthew chapter number 13 and you'll find it starts off a little, uh, a little seed and it flowers out into a large tree and um, I've heard they can grow pretty tall. The mustard, the mustard plants we see around here aren't very tall but I heard they can actually grow pretty tall and then the Bible says in, that, uh, in the limbs of that mustard tree, you know what happens? The ravens or the birds come and lodge therein. It started off small. It started off in the upper room in Acts chapter number 2. And it went on and on and on and on and it grew and grew and grew. Do you think that Satan is going to leave the church unchallenged? Not on your life he's not. I can out preach a young one now. Y'all look up here. Amen. Amen. And, and, and the bird started lodging therein. And that's, that's Satan. He tries to, uh, to, to, to tear apart churches. He tries to uh, weaken the doctrine of churches. He tries to lessen the standards of local churches. That's what the devil wants to do. But my dear friend, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. Why? It's built on the Lord Jesus Christ. Built on the Lord Jesus Christ. What you need to do is start working, witnessing, and serving right here and God will begin to open places of service as you grow. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter number 3, if you would, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and look at verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Isn't that wonderful? Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But what? Verse 14, continue. Stay with the stuff. People quit too soon. Stay with a local assembly. Stay with a local church. Stay with the Lord. Open your Bible. Read your Bible. Come every time the doors are open. Don't take the local church lightly. 
The local church, God ordained it. God commissioned it. And without the local church, my dear friend, you will suffer spiritually. I promise you that. But continue thou in the things, verse 14, which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Well, Paul taught Timothy and permitted him to watch on the job training. I love on the job training. But let me tell you something. Experience without teaching can lead to discouragement. And teaching without experience leads to spiritual deadness. Read 2 Timothy chapter 3 again, verse 10 through the end of the chapter. You need both. You need experience and you need teaching. You need the Word of God and you need to see it in action. I love our Faith Bible College and I love our professors. I have, we have the best professors that this world has ever seen, ever heard. We have them. I wish, I mean this, I wish I would have had that experience and that teaching that goes on in our college today. I wish I'd have had that 30, 40 years ago at Tennessee Temple. I mean that. I really mean that. And I know I'm on YouTube and I know some, I have some old cronies at Tennessee Temple that will hear this. But I wish that we had this particular kind of teaching concerning salvation and the emphasis on the Word of God that Faith Bible College gives. It's our, I, I count it a privilege, Brother Donnell, and I know you do as well, to be able to train men and women to go out and propagate this wonderful book. Amen. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book. And so our college students, not only do they get the best teaching that could ever be provided by man that God has commissioned man to do, but they have the opportunity to experience that, put that into practice. They, our students and you as well go to the nursing homes. They go out with the Moore team. They go on visitation. They go on the bus ministry. They go door to door. They knock. And let me tell you something. I wouldn't give two cents for a man that said they wanted to be used by God that did not work in his local church. Are you getting a hold of this? Brother David the other day was talking about God has laid it on his heart. And I had this message already ready to preach. Um, he was talking about I'm, David, Brother David says, I, I need to be doing what God told me to do. The Bible says in um, um, verse 2 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same do what? Commit thou to faithful men who will do what? He said, God has laid it on my heart to to come in contact with a teenager and work with him five, at least five years. I said, isn't that a blessing? You know, you know why sometimes, and we talk about people not doing things sometimes, you know why that people don't do things? Because the older crowds never took time to train the younger crowd. We can talk about our young men, but I wonder how many of you has had that conviction that we just spoke about. God is going to lead me to somebody and work with them five years. Work with them at least five years. Timothy, it took four to six years. I'm going to work with them at least five years and let them go out with me and talk with them and be their friend and train them so that when I leave, they can take over this. When I leave, they can take over this. I wonder how many, and you, did you know it was never the young woman, never the young lady or the young man going up and asking them, could I learn and could I help? Read it yourself. The older women are commissioned to teach the younger women. You don't wait for a younger woman to ask you. You, be, you. you befriend them and you start teaching them. You know where we failed in our local church? Doing exactly that. Think about what I'm saying. Think about what I'm saying. Us, uh, and I put myself in the older crowd. Us older crowd, we can talk about the youth of today. Man, I wasn't like that when I was their age. We had to work, bless God, when I was growing up. That gets me wore out thinking about it. 
But you know why we say that about the younger generation? We're not taking time to take them under our wing and showing them. I've made the comment several times, I wish I'd have took my two boys when I was building a house and showed them how to wire a house, how to, be, how to, how to use electricity and, and wire. But you know what, I, you know what I was, just like in church, you know what I was too busy doing? I was too busy doing my job and, and thinking about getting my family moved in this house that I didn't take the time to train and to teach. You know what we're doing in the local church? The same thing. The same thing. Yes, we are. We're doing the same thing. So, Timothy, Timothy was, a, was a servant. He had a servant's mind. He had a servant's training, on-the-job training. He was taught out of the Scripture. And then notice his reward in verse 23 and 24 um, of Philippians chapter 2. Back up to Philippians again, if you will. Philippians chapter 2. 23 and 24. We're going to close with this. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I, almost self sh I, that I also myself shall come shortly. Sometimes, I think we'll talk about uh, so much about sacrifice and service, we forget the reward that goes with it. What's the reward right here that goes with this? What's, what's the reward that goes with it? Let me tell you what it is. It's the, it's the joy that we have of helping others. It's the joy that we have of helping others. Let me read to you a scripture out of Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25. Listen to uh, what the Lord has to say in Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. There's joy that we enter in by having that submissive mind, which is having a submissive mind. And any leader worth his salt, any leader worth his salt in the Scripture, and I'm sure present day I could go through a list in my mind, any leader that's worth their salt has been on this particular end. They, they've realized that God has put this particular man or woman in their path to help them. And they glean and they learn everything they can from that individual. Because there's coming a time that that individual, and there's, there's coming a time for our Sunday school teachers, there's coming a time for the pastor of the Faith Baptist Church, there's, there's coming a time that, that someone's going to have to fill the shoes. And, and, and that's a, it's, it's a very serious matter of bringing, again, people from point A to point B. And there's a joy that, that, that goes with that submissive mind. And not only that, but there was a joy in Timothy's life of serving with that particular individual, the Apostle Paul. I charge you therefore before God. What does he say in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And he gives him that last, that last charge before he is, Paul is ready to check out. And he said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them also, also that love is appearing. Um, Paul looks into another world, but you know what? He feels good about himself. He feels good about himself because God had allowed him to pour his life into a man called Timothy. And he was giving Timothy a charge before he checked out and said, you're going to take care of everything. Isn't that something? Wow. I believe that Paul handpicked Timothy for his replacement. Well, really, God picked him. God picked him and God called him. But I reckon, you, or you reckon, or think about it. You, you, you reckon... Timothy knew just how much and how far that God would use him. 
Think back in your life. Um, think back 30 years ago. I don't know, Brother Hively, when you were here before, 30, 35 years ago, I don't know. Whenever it was, did you ever think in your life that God would have you back here serving in the capacity that you're in now? Isn't it? You, you wonder at these people that are surrendering to the call to preach and they're training and they're, and, they're, and they're standing up and saying, God's called me. I wonder if it ever crosses their mind, our minds, just how much God is willing to use you and will use you if you're willing. Wow. Man. So today, that's the end of the message. So today, what you need to do is start where you're at spiritually. And you go on to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody ever heard of a lady named Thelma Thompson? Wrote a book back in 1943. Um, I can't say that I've read it, but I've read excerpts of it. It was called, um, not Outer Rampart, but Br Bright Rampart. Bright Rampart. Say that word, Rampart. Thank you. That's what, yeah. Bright Rampart. 1943, her husband was sent out to Arizona. And um, this is during World War II. And in, in that part of Arizona where she went, there was nothing in the world but, but cactuses. Plural cactuses would be cacti, wouldn't it? Okay, cacti. A lot of cacti. She hated it. She, she hated it. She wrote back home and in her letter to her mom and dad, I hate it out here. God forsaken country. Nothing good. I am so lonesome. And all of this that goes with it. And you know her dad, her wise daddy, picked up a pen and he wrote her a letter back. And he said, two men behind prison bars, one saw mud and the other saw stars. Thelma Thompson became an authority on cacti, cactuses, and the culture of Navajo Indians, and, and, and wrote a book and helped a tremendous amount of people. Well, what are you looking at today? You're looking at mud or stars? What can God do with you? Start where you're at spiritually and go on and serve the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand to our feet, please. All right. Anybody have any comments before we're dismissed? All right. Let's pray and thank God for His goodness and mercy. Yes.